Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello and welcome to Just Branding. Today we have Alexandra Watkins with us. Alexandra is a naming expert and the author of the book, Hello, My Name is Awesome, How to Create Brand Names That Stick. We're going to jump right into that. So hello and welcome to the show, Alexandra. <laughs> Hi, Jacob. Nice to be here. And Matt. And, and Matt. Yep, Matt's here. Don't forget me. We're going to jump love straight it. into it. Uh, but first, I would love to hear your story. Like, how did you mm. come to become a naming expert and write a book about it? Well, I, I started my career as an advertising copywriter and I worked for big agencies like Ogilvy. And every once in a while, I would get thrown a bone and get to name something. And I love naming. And I was I was really good at it. So, uh, But I had no idea that naming was actually a profession. So I was a copywriter for 16 years. And then when I found out that, like, oh, wait a minute, naming is like a bona fide career. So I switched gears and I just decided I'm going to be a professional namer and Naming, as you know, naming uh, is part of branding and branding and advertising never intersect. So I basically had to start over, but make all new contacts in the world of branding. And so I quickly realized I started freelancing for all of these big naming firms, branding firms. And I quickly realized that no one was doing conceptual style of brand names. They were all like based on linguistics and I knew, knew nothing about linguistics. I only knew about how to concept and, and make a great ad headline. So that is the style of names that I started doing. And that's how I, pardon the pun, made a name for myself. Mm -hmm. Just doing very clever conceptual names that when people see them, they get them. Um, they often smile. That releases dopamine. I'm Can you like, share a few? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my my claim to fame and people in the States will know this name is I named the Wendy's Baconator, which is a bacon cheeseburger. It's um, very famous. It has its own Wikipedia page. It was uh, recently the answer to a New York Times crossword. And it was also uh, the answer on Jeopardy, which is a... a very popular game show we have so for for intellectuals <laughs> like to go from naming a bacon cheeseburger for truck drivers to like being on an intellectual game show so yeah the baconator i've gotten a lot of mileage out of that um another really fun name that i've done is a frozen yogurt franchise that i named spoon me i named a gps for dogs retriever and this is appropriate since your audience is global um, I named a Spanish language school in Cali, Colombia, Gringo Lingo. <laughs> Genius. Nice. Love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're going to jump jump into how we actually create names and what makes a good name, some of the mistakes. And I guess that leads us into the, the next point, unless you had more to share. Oh, no, I'll just say that I, so after all of these these firms were putting their good name on my great name. So that's when I was like, okay, I need to start my own firm. So that's when I started Eat My Words. And we started out by naming things that make people fat and drunk, which is why we're named Eat My Words. And we still do a lot of that. And it's by far the most fun thing that we do. Amazing. All right. So your book, how did you come to write in that? Did what, did you see a gap in the market or? No, I got really lucky. I have that like Hollywood starlet story where I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about writing a book and an intern at a publisher came across me on meetup. I was doing a speaking engagement. She went to my website, which is eatmywords.com by the way. And she's like, wow, this is, this is really fun. And she showed it to her, you know, the publisher, you know, editors, and they're like, yeah, this is, and they sent me an email and it just said, thought about writing a book. You know, your writing style is so fun and refreshing and it's so different than business communication today. And we would love to publish a book or two by you. What do you think? And I was like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to write a book. My parents are authors and I know it's a lot of work, but I had a number of conversations with them and then decided, yeah, this is actually a good idea. I should do it. And I'm so glad that I did. Yeah. Yeah. I love your website. I think it's quite funny. Like the, the, the headline on your website, when you first hit it, it says something like your, your, your name 
uh, shouldn't be like someone's got drunk and played Scrabble or something yeah. like that. And, yeah. You know, that's so true, isn't it? And and what a what what an interesting way to sort of introduce yourself, um, you know, as a, as a sort of a, a headline. And I guess that comes from your copywriting background, right? To be able yes. to write. Yes. Like that. And that's, that's, yeah, I've been really lucky because I know how to concept. So I could do a clever headline, like your name shouldn't look like you got drunk and played Scrabble. But yeah, I've been, I've been so fortunate to have that background. Well, let's dive in. What makes a great brand name in, in your opinion? In my opinion, the strongest thing that your name can do is make somebody smile. When you make someone smile, it releases all of these positive neurotransmitters. Don't worry, this is the geekiest I'm going to get. Okay. It, we like geeky. You it, go geeky. It, We're fine. We're it, fine. We nerd out about this stuff. Let's go. Okay. When you make someone smile, it releases all of these positive neurotransmitters like endorphin, serotonin, and that makes people feel good, right? So if your name mm. can make somebody feel good, if people love your name before they've even tried your product, you are golden. So here's an example. We named a cupcake store, the Church of Cupcakes. People love that name before they've even had the cupcakes, right? And it's super memorable. Um, or uh, here's one. I just gave out these for anybody watching, watching instead of listening. I just gave out these heart-shaped, they're glass art hearts um, trophies. And I gave them out to 10 food and beverage names at a big trade show I went to. The 10 most love at first sight names of the show. And by far my favorite name and everybody else's seemed to be gourmet frozen cookie dough. And it's named dopamine, but it's spelled like dough, right? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. So people love names like that. Since the show, I've probably been on, this is the seventh podcast I've done since that show. I talk about that name constantly. I, I, I must say it three times a day in conversations. So when you have a name like that, you're golden, right? So that is the strongest thing that your name can have is the ability to make an emotional connection. And if you can make someone smile, that that's just the best feeling. I think that's so, so smart, Alexandra, because like the other thing I think when you think about um, so so obviously we're on you're on just branding right now and you know we 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 think about brands not just as the logo and the fonts but you know it's a lot wider than that it is about the meaning that people attach to you and just following on from what you've said there I guess um, you know I, I don't know the stats I don't know if you know the stats but I wonder if a study has ever been done which looks at when we come across a new brand how many times do we hear it before we actually see it right i don't know like that i mean i don't know if anyone could even do a study like that but wouldn't that be interesting that actually that the, the logo itself that everyone fixates on right might even be the second or third thing that somebody comes across because potentially they would have heard of that name first through word of mouth or someone talking about the product or the service or whatever it is so interesting right get the name right and everything else follows yeah exactly an example th that's really interesting you brought that up so a lot of times people see something and they think they know how to pronounce it or they might hear it one way. Okay. They might hear it one way. So I kept hearing about this or I kept seeing this logo for this brand name, Crycut, C-R-I-C-U-T. So that's how I pronounce it, Crycut. And it wasn't until I, I got hired by the queen of Crycut to help name one of her, her services, she pronounced it cricket. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, this whole time I've been, been pronouncing it wrong. She's like, oh, half the people pronounce it cricket, half pronounce it cry cut. And what happens in that instance, it's kind of like what you're talking about. So you could be telling me about cricket. Jacob, you could be telling me about cry cut. I would have no idea you're talking about the same thing. Because they yeah. sound completely different, right? So your brand name should only be pronounced one way. Yeah, I love that. There's, I don't know if you're familiar. In the UK, there's a there's a car brand, right? Basically, the way that the the majority of people in the UK were pronouncing it was not correct. So they've had to do like a whole campaign to help us all say their name right. So in the UK, we'd often pronounce their name Hyundai, Hyundai, because that's kind of how oh, it's yeah. sort of spelled. But actually, it's Hyundai, right? That's how they how they pronounce it, Hyundai. But it's funny because here we say Hyundai. 
There we are. So I probably I probably said it wrong, even in my attempt I to say it right. Say it so you're probably Hyundai right. As well. probably Hyundai. So the point the point is though that if you've got a name like that, like it is really confusing. And then for me, like when I see an, a brand, then having to do education around its name rather than talking about its product and you know its service and its benefits, it's clearly that there's a strategic error gone on. Um, at least, you know, at that level. But I guess for them, really tricky for them to then change because it's a global brand now uh, and, you know, it's it's hard. But perhaps we'll come on to to, to, to naming and, and chopping and changing it a bit later on. But yeah, interesting, fascinating. Yeah, no, that, that is really interesting. And yeah, they're, they're a huge company in Korea, but they came into the, U they came into the US and with the car, they first came into the US with the car and I mean, that was probably 40 years ago. And yeah, people are still, I think now with all the TV commercials, people know, but so many times with these, yeah, we have the same thing with this company called Rakuten and nobody knows how to pronounce it. And so their TV ads are some man on the street asking people how they pronounce it. I'm like, what a waste of time and money, right? So when you're starting out with a blank slate, don't give yourself any disadvantages. Because you don't want to spend all the, anytime you're having to explain to somebody, here's how you pronounce it, here's how you spell it, you're essentially apologizing for it, right? And that devalues your brand. 100%. Uh, yeah. So I had another question around what makes a great brand name. So the the smile and the emotional connection, but well, let's say you're, you're in the business environment and it may not be as suitable for that kind of scenario. What are the, some other traits that make a quality brand name? So I have a 12-point name evaluation filter. It's called the Smile and Scratch Test. Smile is an acronym for the five qualities that make a name strong. And Scratch is an acronym for the seven deal breakers that make a name weak. And a lot of those are blind spots that people don't see. So Smile, and these are all the things, whether it's a business to business name, you know, D to C, C to C, that S stands for suggestive. You want your name to suggest a positive brand experience. I mean, more, more than not, you want your name to suggest something about what your brand is or does. But if it's candy, for instance, the name Twizzlers doesn't suggest what the, that the candy is licorice. However, it suggests it, it's a fun name, right? It's a positive brand experience. So it suggests it's going to be a fun experience eating the candy. So yeah, you want your name to be suggestive. Metaphorical names are great for suggestive names. If you think of Amazon being a metaphor for, you know, something very, very large. The M in smile stands for memorable. And what makes something memorable is if it's based in the familiar so it, here in the States and probably globally, there's a, a bike lock company and it's named Kryptonite. And we all know Kryptonite from Superman. So that's based in the familiar, making it easier to remember. And then of course, Kryptonite repels Superman. Therefore, Kryptonite locks repels bike thieves. So that's a great analogy that the metaphorical name is making. So that makes it memorable versus something that's just a brand new, very unfamiliar word or, you know, jumble of letters that, you know, the drunk looks like someone got drunk and played Scrabble name. Um, those aren't familiar and our brain wants something to latch onto, right? It, and if we have something that already exists in our knowledge base, that's what's going to make it easier to recall later on when we're trying to, you know, you might not need a bike lock right now, but three months from now, you might need one. And if you're trying to remember that name, what's going to help you recall it is if it already exists in your brain's dusting filing cabinet, if it already exists in your knowledge base. Brilliant. All right. Are you going to go through the other letters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the I in SMILE stands for imagery. If your name lends itself to uh, visual imagery, then it also makes it easier to recall later. So uh, we named an energy drink for women. We don't just name food and beverage, by the way, but those are always the fun example. Everyone can relate to it. We named an energy drink for women. It was an all natural energy drink. And it was like for the 4 p.m. hour when most women are chugging a Diet Coke like me. And it was all natural energy and it helped you like, you know, revive in the afternoon. So we named it Bloom. And when you hear the name Bloom, you can picture a flower blooming or just a flower. So 
when you're at the grocery store and you're facing that wall of energy drinks and you're trying again to recall it from your brain's dusty filing cabinet in your head, you know how we close our eyes trying to remember something? That's us going through our, our filing cabinet, right? But, but if you saw the name or you heard the name Bloom, you're going to be able to recall it more easily because you will have already pictured something in your head. And then you'll have that picture in your mind. It reminds me of Gorilla Tape. Yes, you know, I love tape. that name. It's a very strong, strong name. Even the logo, it's like very unusual. It literally features a big gorilla and such a strong name that ties in with the strength of the, the tape. Yeah, I love that name. That's a great example. I should use that use that example there you go that, you got that, something out of this so. <laughs> the, L right. the, L? <laughs> the l stands for legs and legs is the hardest thing to do with the name unless you hire us because we'll do it for you but legs but it's the best thing to have and legs is when your name lends itself to a theme so you can extend your brand through wordplay so an example is uh there's a podcaster named jason sircone and he read my book. I had been on his podcast. And then he said, I want to do another podcast. So he read my book. And he came up with the name for his company, Bomb Track Media. Then he named his podcast, Let's Blow This Up. Like, that's such a great name, right? And it plays into Bomb mm -hmm. Track. And then he calls his audience the Bomb Squad. And he calls his studio the Bomb Shelter. And he has packages like TNT and Dynamite. So you can see how that's a name with legs because it just it's it's you can extend it forever and ever. So um, you know he does it talks about explosive growth. So that's a name with legs, and um, those they're just they're endless. I mean they're just really fun to have. And eat my words, you know my company name is one of those names as well. We have, you know, we have a value menu. We have a um, Packages like fun size and the whole enchilada and supermarket special. Um, if you're watching this, you can see in my office, there's the pink refrigerator that um, that's where I keep my my books in a 1950s retro pink fridge. I, and, I saw a flamingo floating around in the reflection uh -oh. as well. Uh -oh. Wait, Rival you, flamingo. Oh, you can see it in the, wow. Yeah, the reflection. there's- Yes. For anyone who wants uh -huh. to see, go go to on Instagram, go to San Diego Bitchin Backyard. Um, Bitchin, just like it sounds, no G. And uh, yeah, you can see we have a Bitchin Backyard. Yeah, there's two other flamingos that will be in there soon. And we have a cheeky bar, surfboard fence with 26 surfboards and a bunch of skeletons. We have just a very, very fun and playful backyard. I love, I love it. Yeah, the, the theme that you're talking about, like the legs, it's, you know, we're talking about flamingos now, they have legs. But as a theme, like, uh, you know, flamingos, you, your office could be a sanctuary, for example. Or, yeah, oh, the know, flock. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I've used the flamingos flock. a lot. Yeah, flock on, yeah, flock party. Yeah, there's so much you can do. All right, cool. So legs or like a theme that kind of ties everything together. Then you have E, which is... Yeah, the E is, it goes back to a name that makes people smile. If you can have a name that makes a strong emotional connection, and it doesn't have to be that you make somebody smile, but maybe it's like Gorilla Glue. It, like you said, it's a strong image, right? And like, it's a cool name. When we see it, we like it, like we get it. So when, when you have a brand, and you guys know this, that resonates with somebody, that's when you're connecting with them. And that's what people will remember. All right. Okay. So we've done the full smile, if that's right. And then yep. you had another framework for deal breakers, the scratch. Yeah. So that's scratch. So if it makes someone scratch their head, or if it will make someone scratch their head, scratch it off the list. So the S stands for spelling challenge. You want your name to be spelled exactly how it sounds. And your name shouldn't look like a typo. It, it's just that simple. And a lot of people have you know, they, they're so desperate to find an available domain name that they'll spell their brand name wrong. And it's kind of being penny wise and pound foolish. Like we've all done this. We've emailed somebody, their email gets bounced back because we spelled the name of their company wrong, or we're trying to find it online. We can't because it's not spelled the way it sounds. So uh, your name shouldn't, like I said, it shouldn't look like a typo. Don't drive proofreaders batshit crazy. Um, the first C in Scratch stands for copycat. 
nobody likes a copycat. Mm. Uh, why be somebody else when you can be yourself? So I was going to ask you about that actually, because one one thing that I guess is 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 tricky is kind of coming up with unique things in particular marketplaces and space. Uh, 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 how how can somebody be sure that they're not being a copycat? Say they come up with a great name, like. How, what sort of checks do you recommend or suggest or how do you think people should attack that question? Like, you know, how do I, how will they know? It, first of all, do your trademark research, you know, have a, have a reputable trademark attorney and do your research for you. Um, if you're in the States, you can start off on USPTO.gov and just the, they recently updated their whole system and it's so much easier to use now. It is no longer like a government website. <laughs> Um, but one thing you can do is go away from the norm. So we were naming a data analytics company, like super boring, right? And all of the data analytics companies at the time were using, the, it was when the cloud was relatively new. So they were all, all had names with cloud in them. I called it the cloud crowd. There were so many. And the, the company came to us and they had one of those cloud names and it was little you, and then the word Cirrus, like Cirrus Cloud. And they it was difficult for people. They didn't know how to pronounce it. They The little U and then the big C was weird. So instead of looking to clouds, what which was everybody else was doing, we went in the other direction and we did a deep dive into data analytics, learned all, you know, what is what is it all about really? And it's, it boils down to, it's looking for patterns, right? That's what these analysts are doing. They're looking for patterns. So we started looking at names of patterns and we saw the name Argyle. And Argyle, as you know, it's a diamond pattern. So we made it about finding, di it was Argyle data and it was all about finding diamonds in the data. So is Argyle finding diamonds in the data was their tagline. And if you think about Argyle, it's super masculine pattern, right? Like only men really wear Argyle and or traditionally, so it's it's it appeals to the target audience, which is primarily men. It's really visual, right? You uh, when you hear the name Argyle, you can picture the pattern in your head, an Argyle sweater, Argyle socks, and then it's super unexpected. It's familiar to us. It's memorable, but it's so different and so unexpected. It really stands out and among the cloud crowd, right? So that's an example of, of one of those style of names. Love it. Of a name that's Brilliant. not a copycat versus a copycat. The R in scratch stands for restrictive and that is where you outgrow your name. So it, I think a lot of people know when they've outgrown their name. A classic example is in Canada, there is a store called Canadian Tire and they sell way more than tires. They sell trampolines, toys, tools, tropical plants, a lot of stuff that not everything begins with T. But that is a company that really outgrew their name. And in the 80s, their tagline was, we sell more than tires. Like, what a waste of a tagline. So they should have changed their name a long time ago. But that's a name that's restrictive. So everybody in Canada at this point knows the Canadian Tire sells more than tires. But if they wanted to roll into the UK, into Australia, the States, they would have to spend a fortune on an ad campaign. Can you imagine this new, you're driving down the road and you see this new big box store named Canadian Tire? Like, but then they don't, they sell way more than tires. Like what a, st like what a stupid name, right? So the second you start feeling like your, your name your, is restrictive to what you're selling, it's probably time to change it. Then the A and scratch stands for annoying. And annoying is when your name frustrates people. So an example is, let's say you have a number in the middle of your name. So your company is called Coast to Coast, but it's spelled Coast numeral to Coast. That's going to annoy people and frustrate them. Uh, if your name is spelled backwards, people get confused. They think, Oh, but it's so creative, right? It is creative to spell your name backwards. Just because something's creative doesn't mean it's a good idea, right? We've all seen very creative art. It may be creative to wear, you know, two different colored socks. 
<laughs> Does that make good fashion sense? You usually not. So really keep that in mind. Um, I think you know, there's like listeners right now going like checking their socks quickly just to make sure. <laughs> well, engineer happened. engineers are really guilty of, of <laughs> annoying of yeah wearing black socks. No annoying names because they they kind of fall in love with like the classic spelled the name backwards was uh, Zobni X O B N I which was inbox spelled backwards, but nobody knew looking at it that it was inbox spelled backwards because we don't intuitively spell things backwards. No. So yeah, that was, and, a, that was and, a big And the way that names pronounced is not great. Like a zombie brand is probably No, Zobni. Not. Well, here's the thing. It was pronounced Zobni and that's how they There's were going to pronounce it. It had a little accent mark over it, Zobni. And then right. Bill Gates pronounced it Zobni. So they changed the pronunciation of it because he pronounced it that way yeah there's a lot of faults in that one <laughs> another category that i just don't understand are like is the tech uh tech world with like monitor numbers and like they have all these numerals and like numbers you'll never remember well like why do they do that i don't know why they do it i think back to engineers and yeah like it makes sense to them but you know i prefer like you know when Apple did the operating systems with the big cat names, you know, like Snow Leopard and Panther. Like mm. those are cool. They're easy to remember. Um, can you easily put them in order? No, but when a new, like when a new OS comes out, we know we hear about it. So they ran out of big cat names. So then they went into California names, which is a smarter thing to do because there's way more things in California. I think they've made a couple of mistakes. So Apple would never test a name. And I, I think that's great. I'm a big believer in don't test a name, but also they should be a little smarter. Look, I'm a huge Apple fan, but I think the name Yosemite, unless you live in California or you're mm. familiar with Yosemite Sam from Bugs Bunny, you would pronounce that word Yosemite because it looks like it's pronounced Yosemite, like Vegemite, right? Right, Jacob? <laughs> and then um, with Mavericks, so Mavericks is a surf spot in Northern California, but nobody, Mavericks is plural, but it sounds like it should be Maverick. Maverick would be mm -hmm. a product name. Mavericks is weird for a singular product name. So I think those are two mistakes they made. And there's so many things in California that they could have chosen from. I, I think they could have done a better job on those two. I just love the simplicity of iPhone one, two, three, four. Like it's just, you understand where you are in the, the lineup. It's, it's very clear. It's not very creative, but it, it, it yeah. helps me understand like what model is out. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a, yes, for um, whatever. Yeah. Numbers make sense a lot of times. Yeah. But they're not as fun. You're right. Yep. <laughs> All right. So we're up to T, I think. Or yes, the T so in Scratch stands for tame. And you don't want your name to be a wallflower. You want your name needs to stand out and make some noise. Quiet names don't get noticed. You know, there's so much, so many things are vying for attention right now. So you can't afford to be shy. Even if you're like B2B, you can still be clever and be a B2B name. We name a lot of law firms and we did one for... Uh, startups in San Francisco, and they're all about helping startups get their foundational documents. It's all about the foundation. So we named it Bedrock, and people knew Bedrock from the Flintstones. And what happened is when we named it Bedrock, the primary attorney, Layla Benajamali, had been using her own name, and she knew people had trouble pronouncing it, spelling it, remembering it. So that's when she said, I want a brand name instead. And she said, once she changed the name to Bedrock, they started attracting the type of clients that they wanted to work with. It's a cool name, cool people liked it, and that's who they attracted. So that's another thing that a name can do for you. It can help you, like, you know, eat my words, we're attracting people, the type of people that we want to work with because they appreciate how fun our name is. Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. So then the second C in Scratch stands for curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge, again, an engineer thing. Sorry to hate on the engineers, but you guys make, you guys have just made things so difficult. Why did you even call it W? 
What's up with the www? Why couldn't it just be web dot? www is nine syllables. Web <laughs> is one. Right? I get it. World Wide Web, word. but it was abbreviation. No one likes abbreviations. So the um, curse of knowledge is where you know what it means, but you forget that nobody else knows what it means. So it's it's a good way to think of the curse of knowledge as if something's foreign. Either it's a foreign word, so maybe it means something in Swahili, but people don't know Swahili, or it's just foreign to people, like it's back to being unfamiliar. So an example of a name with the curse of knowledge is this guy. We have, a, by the way, the smile and scratch test is on our website. And so people take it every day and I see the names that come through. And this guy submitted a name. It was called Moran Quest. And it was for some government contracting, government consulting thing. And he said Moran, M-O-R-A-N was the Maasai word for like strength or warrior or mean, meant something like that. And I'm like, it is, and he's like, is it too close to moron? And I'm like, yeah, that's a problem. But the main problem is like, nobody speaks the Maasai language. <laughs> Sorry, they're just not going to know that. So yeah, that's curse of knowledge, right? And you're not going to be there to explain it to somebody. And then finally, the H in scratch stands for hard to pronounce. And we talked about that with Cricket and Crycut. And yeah, you only want your name to be pronounced one way or you're going to dilute your brand. Oh, well, it's quite a list there. That's a very thorough list to go through. If you can get, get through all of them, I'd be, it's definitely not easy, is it? You know what? It's not, it's not as hard as people think. It's, it's not as hard as people think. And I mean, if you look at our portfolio, you'll, you'll see a hundred examples of, hey, these names all pass the smile and scratch test. Um, but yeah, it is. it can be hard for people. I was going to say, Alexander, do you find that um, as you're, you know, crafting these names that, um, that sometimes um, some names score higher in some areas, if you like, and lower in other areas? Yeah. Um, they might all pass or, or, you know, but, but there's still some sort of variation in terms of the quality of the name based on the criteria that you've set. Yeah. So sometimes like a name won't have legs, but it's still a good name. Um, mm. But we're always trying to go for the, you know, the five factor, I guess you could call it to have all five. Um, but legs is one, like some people are like, no, that's okay. I don't, I don't need it. But sometimes it's just like such a great name. So we were, I was having a kickoff call with someone the other day. And this is a woman that she lives in Michigan, which is in middle America. She's a farmer and she's a meat farmer. So she raises rabbits, chickens, geese, lamb, um, not cows, but but a lot of other animals. And she then butchers and sells at the local farmer's market. So she wanted a name that would, that she could monetize with merchandise. And those are our favorite kind of names because that we want to do a very clever name that will make people smile. So the name that we came up with plays into the fact that this whole idea of wholesomeness and it harkens back to a more innocent time, like the 1950s, where, where meat was more wholesome, right? Because she doesn't, you know, she's organic and all of that. So uh, if you guys are familiar with the TV show, Leave it to Beaver, um, which was a 1950s, no, 1960s TV show. And it was this, you know, family june and ward cleaver with the two boys wally and beaver beaver cleaver and uh june cleaver was like the typical 50s housewife and she wore a pearl necklace and she was always you know dressed in her perfect apron and so mrs cleaver was her name so i i quickly realized talking to this woman on the kickoff call i'm like i have the perfect name for you mrs cleaver so to anybody here in the states they would totally get that and so that's becoming her name. So it's going to be Mrs. Cleaver with the descriptor is wholesome meat because wholesome ties into a more wholesome time. And then the fact that it's like, you know, organic. So organic is a very here in the States, a very like kind of West Coast. 
East Coast kind of snobby thing. But in middle America, like it's not as important, but wholesome sounds good. And for these tourists at the market too, they, they're, you know, they're a wholesome part of the country. And then with the tagline, she's all about, uh, she's very ethical and she's all about preventing climate change. So uh, her tagline that I did is for caring carnivores. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 So I did all of that. Yeah. Well, on the kickoff call, I'm like, I know your name. And then I'm like, okay, let's do a follow-up call. do all the other stuff. Yeah. But I'm very fast. Very fast. Yeah. That's that's very fun. I love. Thank you. And she's. I I had a question around getting names across the line, right? So it's a very subjective matter name. So how do you actually get a name? sold you know if you're for our listeners who are trying to go through this naming process and they're presenting names like how do you get them across the line well one thing is use the smile and scratch ass because that will at least help you evaluate and tell you if the name is strong or weak and then if you are presenting to a lot of people and you need to justify why something's a great name go to chat chat sucks at coming up with names what it's phenomenal at is writing rationale and I actually did a um, an April Fool's joke where I, do you guys celebrate April Fool's where you are? I mean, celebrate, celebrate is a stretch. Okay. Well, I guess thing. celebrate is a strong word, right? Yeah. We don't like have a, <laughs> it's not like a bar thing, but yeah, we play April, <laughs> we prank each other. So I did this prank yeah. where I said that Elon Musk hired us to name his new baby and no one even questioned, not one person questioned if he had a baby. Because he has like 10 or 11 kids. And I had this photo of him holding this baby. I said it was a baby girl, but the photo is him holding a baby boy. But like, you know, no one knows when it's a baby. And so I said that he hired us. And so I had gone on ChatGPT and I, oh, I came up with the name, which was XX Chromosome. Does not totally sound like something Elon Musk would name his his daughter because <laughs> he loves the letter X and like double X chromosome is, is a girl. So... I went, that's, that's the only part I had down. And then I went on chat GPT and I said, I I'm playing this prank, you know, here's the name, Elon Musk, write the most complex, detailed description of why it's a great name, go into the linguistics of it, the science of it. Oh my God. If you go on my LinkedIn, you can see it. It's phenomenal what it did. I mean, just paragraph after paragraph about why it's a great name. And it was like so high level what it wrote. So if you need help selling in a name, just go to ChatGPT and you don't have to ask it for a complicated thing, but just say, why is this a great name? And I've done it before on the call with a client where they're like, okay, remind me why this is a great name. I'm like, I usually just like something or I don't like something, but I like just put it to ChatGPT and it's great. And we let it write all of our rationale now. Because it's it just, it's just very, it's, it's going to see things that I might not see. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's a good way to Scra- sell it. scratch and smile test. And then, you know, rationale, is there anything yeah. else you'd. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of other criteria you can ask yourself. It depends what's important. You know, do you want to monetize the name? Then that's something what's important, right? Do you have to have, no one's going to get an exact match domain anymore, but to a lot of people that's really important about the domain name. So like make all the criteria that matters. And I would say another thing is just when you are going to sell in a name to other people, just get everybody on board, you know, kind of beforehand, like prime the pump, you know, let them know, okay, the names we're going to show you today, all pass this test, you know, send it to them in advance and that will help. Okay. So the domain thing is very, it comes up often, like, and it can kill a lot of names. So how do you deal with this situation? Don't let a great name be killed by the lack of available domain names. There are 350 million domain names registered right now. So the chance of you finding an exact match domain name that isn't taken or isn't for sale for a hundred grand is, is very unlikely. So just get that idea out of your head that that's even a possibility. A lot of what I do when I talk to clients is set expectations. Like you're not going to get a one word name. Like those don't exist anymore. You're not going to get a one word domain name. So just 
just go into it assuming that you're going to add a modifier word. So you're going to have, you know, if we weren't eatmywords.com, we could be eat my words, names, brand names, naming, the branding. Just get used to the fact that you're going to add a word to your domain name. And it's actually not a bad thing. If we were eat my words naming, for instance, it would help with our search engine optimization. And that's what happens when you have a modifier. No one expects you to have a pure match domain name, especially not one that people can spell. And don't sacrifice spelling to get that butchered spelling just because you can. Um, and even with the butchered spellings, it's just so hard to get anything. So an easy workaround is just add the domain name and or add a modifier word. And you can either do it before or after the word. So, you know, we could have like, we are eat my words, but it's better to have it after the main name because then people won't be confused. Like, wait, is their name? We are eat my words. So have it after. The other thing is you can do some creative workarounds such as, having so we we were naming this gourmet popcorn store and the name we came up with was pop psychology and the domain name was taken but we so in psychology is is hard for some people to spell so we use the tagline as the domain name which was crazy for popcorn that's more, much more memorable easier to type exactly sense. it's more memorable and it helps extend the brand then another thing and it makes people smile and we didn't do this one, but this is one of my favorites. It is a mail order turkey company and it doesn't have a great name. It's Greenberg Smoked Turkeys. You know, Greenberg could be spelled two different ways, but their domain name is unforgettable. It's gobblegobble.com. Hmm. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Okay. So what about a really stubborn S, uh, like CEO who wants a .com, is insisting on it? Uh, how do you deal with that? We well, we'll first say how much are you prepared to spend on a domain name and kind of set the set like give them a reality check because people have no idea how much they cost. I mean, they're they're so expensive now. So I think a lot of times when we do that, they're they'll back down. Or if they're like, no, we don't because oftentimes we'll say, what's more important? Having a good name or having an available domain? Well, the domain name. So they were like, we're not a good fit for you because we're never gonna acquiesce to a, an available domain name if the name is something like you know zobney <laughs> all right so it's about setting expectations early in the process isn't yeah it? And, and yeah positioning so yourself did, yeah and your methodology yeah i just did that today i i had a call with with a client that before when we named something for them it was um some autonomous surface vessels that they sell to the military and the, the that was kind of crowded trademark wise but it wasn't like today they need names for their software. And I'm like, yeah, this is a whole different beast. It's so much harder. So yeah, I set the expectations and they didn't care about the domain name because they have a company name that the, that the software will go under. But I just had to say, yeah, it's probably going to be a two word name. Nothing really predictable is going to be available. So yeah, a lot of times it is just setting expectations. Great. And what about changing brand names? You know, a lot of times there's equity in the name. Like when is it too late to change a name? Like how do you know when to change? The time to change your name is when you feel you've outgrown it. Like, and, and you know, it's kind of like, think about this. Like, have you ever been in a relationship and you feel like you've outgrown it, but you stay in it too long? It's the same thing with a name. Like it, if it's time, you just know when it's time. Maybe there's some confusion. If somebody said, if I just moved to Canada, and I asked someone if somebody told me they worked at Canadian Tire and they told me like, oh, oh, your kid needs a trampoline. You should come in. I'd be like so confused. Like, wait, what do you mean? So people start finding out pretty quickly that they've outgrown their name or just that their name. Look, if your name has problems, you already know. I don't even need to tell you if people are spelling it wrong, if they're questioning the pronunciation or what it means, you know then that's time to change your name. It's not working for you. It's working against you. We've changed many names. We have now changed two brand names that were more than 100 years old. One was a bank named First National Bank of Syracuse. Syracuse is a big town in uh, our big city in New York, but it wasn't that big city in New York. It was a tiny little town in Kansas in the middle of the country. So the name was a disconnect. 
and they were a maverick bank. They wanted a name that was more, more about, you know, they were all about making dreams come true. So that's the direction we went in and we named them Dream First. It's really different for a bank. And then, nice. although although in the UK and Australia, I think the bank, the bank, like egg in the UK, like I've always mm. loved that name. Another one, we just named some community healthcare centers and they were named Queen's Care and they had that name forever and they didn't want to give up the name, but they were forced to for, you know, legal reasons for some something or other. And so Queen's Care and they really, that's the hardest thing for us to do is when someone's being forced to change their name, very different when somebody wants to change their name. So they're being forced. They cannot let go, but we're like, you're just going to have to let it go. You cannot use it anymore. Let's just move on. So they are faith-based community health centers. And so we came up with a name that was really visual, evocative, and pretty. And the name is Grace Light. So that is their new name. Beautiful. I've got another question as well. So, okay, so we've talked about when it's good to change your name, but I've got this circumstance, right? So I was going to throw it on the table and see, 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 you know, how you would attack this. So I've got a client at the moment um, who have gone through a lot of merger and acquisitions. So they're scaling fast. They're in the, the tech space. I won't go into any specifics, but what's happened is as they've acquired new businesses, they've acquired their teams and their specialisms, but also the platforms and the the kind of the software, if you like, that sits underneath that. And their, their ultimate aim is to amalgamate it all into one beautiful kind of system that makes sense. But as we're moving into that space, um, we've got a number of challenges because all these things are called different things, right? So I've got a, literally got a workshop in a, in a couple of weeks in Europe um, where we're gonna actually start the process of, of actually just getting all these, some of, some of the members of these teams together to sort of start mapping out inside their individual kind of companies, what it what, what they call everything, right? Because it's so confusing. So we're gonna start that, but I know that even once we've done that and we've gone through some simplification, what we're actually looking at is a portfolio situation where there's an architecture of different kind of product and services, if you like, that connect underneath one um, kind of umbrella brand, if you like. And I was thinking about throwing an example on the table of a, of a brand that I think has probably been a bit like that and, and just what your thoughts are. So if you think of like Adobe, right, mm -hmm. and Adobe software, you've got a number of names like Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, After Effects. These are all individual apps or programs, if you like, that sit under the Adobe name. Now, I've, I'm going to be in that kind of situation, but I've got this opportunity with this client to say, okay, well, let's rationalize what we call things because um, at the moment there's that opportunities there. Um, and unlike Adobe, like I kind of look at Adobe Suite, for example, and I see very, uh, I, I guess like it doesn't sort of make sense. Why is one After Effects, two words that kind of join together, but another one is uh, you know, Illustrator, which is sort of one singular word. So what I'm sort of advocating for is a system that sits behind our, our naming strategy for new items that come in or things that are already within the portfolio. I just wondered if you're, what your thoughts were on that uh, and, and whether you had any kind of thoughts for businesses or brands in similar situations. Yeah, sure. And Adobe, so it's funny because I see the common, and we've worked with Adobe, I see the common denominator in all of their names is like, they're all easy to spell and pronounce, right? Like, like For sure. they're, they're, there's no got drunk and played Scrabble names, right? So I would say that's, that's a pretty simple common denominator. When you're working with all these brands that are all coming together, there might be a lot, and maybe it is that simple, but usually it's not. People are going to be duking it out and saying, no, go with, because this is what, what, what's happened with us in the past is when there's a merger, we had a company merge. It was Hudson River Healthcare merged with Bright Point Health and some other company. And they, they're like, should we make them all together? Hudson Bright, you know, and we're like, no. And then, oh, and they insisted on keeping the logo, one of the, you know, these deals who knows what you're going to find out, but this is, if I had known this when, 
when uh, <laughs> my salesperson bid on the job, if I had known we were going to be forced to use the logo of a son and we couldn't use words with a GH sound because we had to appeal to Spanish speaking audiences and they have trouble with the GH sound. So we couldn't use the word light or bright, but we had to use the sun. Like, no, that's like removing so many things from what we're able to do. But sometimes you have to like figure out in advance what are the what are all the parameters and we ended up naming them sun river health which is a really pretty name but i would say go into it and kind of like don't do the what i call the amalgamated clusterfuck when you know people are just combining things together like who's who's the strongest like can they all fit under that name now do all the if all the names do work together try to find a tagline that can tie them all together maybe like that to me seems like a really easy thing to do. Is, will the company will the company have one name? Is it like a company with lots of different products? Um, yeah, the company's got a pretty strong name. Um, so it's more like the sub, the sub. Uh, what would you call it? The ch the child brands that sit underneath. And I think you're right. I think what I'm hearing, and 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 you know, this is great to hear for for me. You know, so thanks for this free for, free free advice that that you're giving out. But hopefully, it's 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 helping other people. Um, what I'm hearing is, is set out that criteria, make sure you know the parameters and, you know, make sure that that's really, really clear. I mean, my my philosophy on this, they have got some really awful names in the suite and, uh, you know, a lot of them fail on the scratch stuff massively. Um, and they know that. Right. So that's why this opportunity has come together to to rethink all of it. So uh, all of it's on the table. It's going to be a fun process. It's going to be I definitely think I'm going to come across some of the stuff that you've said. I'm already getting a sense of egos at play. And, you know, oh, that's that's our name. You know, you can't change that, you yeah. know. And But it is it, it's it's all going to be considered and thought through and rationalized to fit with a strategy to position the the, the, the brand and all of its assets powerfully. It's just complicated. And um, I think it's going to be fun. But but yeah, definitely set out that criteria early. Make sure that um, you understand the parameters. And um, yeah, I guess it's a, a case of going for it. And for me, it, it is, you know, it's one of those things where um, just because you've had that name, you know, for 10 years since it, you found it or whatever, as you rightly say, doesn't make it a great name. And particularly then when you put that in a suite, right? Because now um, as a customer, I'm navigating around your world. Right. And you we just got to make it simple. I quite liked what you said about um, earlier in the show about the the Apple OS X kind of naming around, uh, you know, animals, for example, or, or uh, and I just think, yeah, we just need to kind of keep it simple, keep it slick um, and think and just have a rationale so that, you know, when somebody else in the business goes, hey, I'm going to create this new platform. There is some thought behind what we're going to actually call that. And it's not going to be completely splintered and bizarre and confusing. So I'll I'll do my best and I'll come back to you, Alexandra, and tell you where I got to eventually. <laughs> okay. So I'll give you I'll give you some tips. So with like animal names, planet names, Greek god name, like those have all been done. So yeah. and a strategy that I like is one that Ford uses where I don't know if they're still doing it, but all of their cars with start with F. Fiesta, Fairmont, Future, Futura, there's lots and lots. So that's a really simple strategy, just using a letter of the alphabet. Another is, and don't use the word F, use the letter F, F, there's very, which is crazy, but I get it with Ford, but the letter S, and the S is in supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and the where the letter C, as in copycat, that those letters have more words associated with them than anything else. And then go obscure, you know, go obscure. Don't go predictable, especially in software. It's just, it's all been done. Or maybe it's all after, you know, colors or, you know, go for some obscure colors. I, I don't know, but get people to agree like if people are going to be trying to brainstorming be brainstorming on the fly that's going to be really really hard i would just tell people let's not make this a brainstorming meeting let's make this a strategy meeting i mean you're a strategist and that's how i'm going to play it yeah for sure yeah yeah because once because everybody fancies themselves as being a really you know really good at coming up with names coming up with names and people don't the, no one's ever learned how to do this in school really or yeah, they don't do it every day so that they don't have the knowledge. Um, but I, I did want to tell you what, another strategy is 
Do you guys have Ben and Jerry's ice cream there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so you know what Ben and Jerry's, so Ben and Jerry's just named after two guys, not a clever creative name at all, but how the made everything weave together is with their flavor names are all really fun. So, you know, there's Cherry Garcia, Chunky Monkey, Liz Lemon. So that's how they've been able to have a theme. So if you can just find a theme that you can work with, that that will really help. Yeah, brilliant. Buy the theme, folks, for your suite of of uh, names in your portfolio. Love it. Brilliant. I also thought of another technique. You know, Apple they use the like iWatch and iPad, and you know have the, mm. the, the something before it, but it's not perfect because you know the AirPods they have as a, they don't have i. Pods, I guess, because there's already an iPod, so that kind of like broke and the watch system. as well, right? It's not iWatch, yeah, right? exactly. It's so, watch. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not perfect, but you know, it's another another way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And then that's a, that that was so copycatted, right? There was the i yeah, everything. It was. I guess, yeah, there was. It but was it but it annoys me, right? Like like that that description, what you just said there, Jacob, really annoys me. Like it's like yeah, iPad. I, you know, iPhone, all of that works. And then suddenly we go Apple Watch. Like, like, no, like that's, you know, exactly what you're saying, Alexandra, about legs. It's like, for some reason, that wasn't a thing. Um, maybe a legal reason or something like that. But like, it, it frustrates me as a strategist looking at that, that that's, that, 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 that doesn't fit the beautiful criteria of what's gone before. So, you know, and I think that rationale, you kind of, you need to have that to have alignment and uh, and progression as, as a business scales. So yeah, you know, it's hard, clearly, if Apple can't do it, you know, it's, it's a tough one, but I think we should try. Yeah, that's interesting about, I never thought about Apple Watch and iWatch. And I imagine when they were first using the eye, they they must have brainstormed what, what products could we, you know, looking into their crystal ball, what products could we possibly introduce? And a watch is pretty, pretty. I, I mean, not like any of us would know the technology that it would be able to do, but but still like, oh, it could, you know, an eye car, like, you know, you just look around like, uh, yeah. So I don't know how they didn't get that name. I know, right? And like the latest, like uh, 3D, uh, the uh, virtual reality goggles that they have is called like Vision Pro. It's like, but like, why? Why wouldn't you call that Eye Vision or um, yeah, I don't know, Eye Goggle or whatever? I don't know, whatever. It's like, it's like they've sort of. It sounds to me like there's been a strategy to actually to break from the Eye whatever, and so the new tech that's coming out has changed that, you know, from that. But hey. It's it's one of those things, and it frustrates me because it's such that was such a distinctive thing, rightly or wrongly, it was very distinctive in the market to to call it that, and you knew immediately it was Apple. So, yeah, interesting, interesting to ponder. So, Alexandra, we talked about brainstorming. What are some other you know techniques you use to come up with a great name, or our listeners could use? Um, one that I like a lot is to go to stock photo libraries or just Google Images and type in words that will just stimulate ideas. So, you know, a picture says a thousand words. So that's something you can do. Just brainstorm looking at pictures, um, type in some keywords. If you were naming something fast, you could type in, you know, things that are fast, you know, fast and are quick. And it's going to show you, you know, somebody running and it's going to show you a, a, you know, a Puma. Maybe that's where the name Puma came from. So things like that. So just look at pictures. And, and also when you're looking at the pictures, don't say them in your head, say them out loud. Because, well, one, it's going to wake up your brain more. And two, you'll be able to hear if something doesn't sound right. So sometimes, like, if I was looking at a bird flying and I thought soars, you know, but then when I say soars out loud, it's like, oh, that sounds like it could be like a wound, you know, a sore. So that's why it's important to say things out loud, too. Mm -hmm. No one wants a sore. All right. So looking at visual images and what other techniques do you use? Uh, like I use rhyming dictionaries all the time. So I talked about gringo lingo. I mean, that came out of my own head, but uh, yeah, rhyming dictionaries and then go deep. So I was naming this blow dry bar and the client wanted a name that was whimsical yet sophisticated. Hardest thing to do. Hardest thing to do, but we love a challenge. So I was looking up the word blow and everything that rhymed with it. And I saw the word Chateau and that was deep, right? Chateau Blow. And that's like, this is a great name. It's whimsical and sophisticated. So yeah, that's just a great 
place to look for ideas. And AI, you mentioned it before, not a big fan of, of creating names. Personally, I find it very useful for combining things like, uh, you know, themes and so forth. So do you use it as part of your yeah. brainstorming? Yes, we'll use it if we're looking for something really specific. So if the client has a theme of, te- you know, Texas, we'll look at, you know, give us a list of things in Texas. So th- there it's very helpful, but where, and then with the rationale, as I mentioned, or just kickstarting a brainstorming, like give me a bunch of words that start with the letter M, uh, you know, interesting words that start with the letter M. That's where it's great. But if you try to say like, Come up with a name for a Spanish language goal. There's no way it's coming up with gringo lingo. It does not, ChatGPT does not do clever at all. It's it's like the worst, like the sense of humor is so over the top, dad joke, groan, like, oh my God, there's like, it, I hate all the, it's like ridiculously silly, bad puns, um, or just like jokey. It's like third grader humor, right? It's that. So like I was naming a, a travel game company for families and kids. And one of the names I came up with was Tripopotamus, like Hippopotamus. It's not going to come up with that. You know, fee fi fo fun fee fi fo fam it, It's just not. And th- those I just, those, some of those are just in my head, you know, or I'm just playing around with the word family, like fam. Okay, what's fam close to? Fun, you know, so it's just kind of, fooling around, but uh, ChatGPT can write taglines. I will give it that, but it's also great for, I was trying to come up with 800 numbers for, you know, toll-free numbers for one of my clients that wanted an easy to remember number. So I asked it, come up with four, two, three, four, and five letter words around, it was all around um, wealth. So it gave me a bunch of words and then I just put them together. And then another time, oh, I was trying to come up with, I do these power hour consulting calls. Well, I'll spend an hour with you on the phone and I'm just like a machine. And this is where ChatGPT has been helpful to me. So I was trying to come up with a tagline. So the woman, her company name was, it was wealth management and her target audience was Christian women. So she had the name Full Bloom Financial. So I put into ChatGPT, Give me a list of words that are common to both the theme of religion and and wealth and growth. It came up with some words. Not all of them were great, but I saw the word abundance and I'm like, oh, I love the word abundance. That works for both. And then just in my head, I'm like, live in abundance. Right. And so, yeah, so so it's it's helpful for doing like uh, it would have taken me a really long time on my own to find those words. And this is where it can be super helpful, but you have to know how to prompt it. Yeah. What does come down to it is prompts. Yeah. The input. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of AI, it kind of leads into the future. Like what do you see as the the future of brand naming? Well, I think more and more names are going to be taken because of all the AI companies that are now out there. I mean, we, we have named a number of AI companies now. Um, but more and more names are going to be so taken, but also I think like AI naming is like the lowest common denominator. It's just, and so I'm, I'm sad that people are going in that direction, but I feel like it's a long ways off from doing something. It's not coming up with the Baconator. Yeah. It's, it's just not. It's not coming up with Mrs. Cleaver for a meat farm. It lacks the clever, the cleverness in the. It really the... does. Yeah. So have you noticed any other trends in naming recently? You know, we've. Yeah, I have. Um, with domain names, I, I saw this today um, with a designer, actually. His domain name wasn't a .com. It was a .studio. So I think people are more comfortable with the top level domain names is what those are called. They don't work for everyone. What I would caution you against, the studio is fine because it's a real word that we know where it gets to be problematic is when there are these country codes. So for instance, .io. Do either of you guys know what .io stands for? No. It's, I know when to, <laughs> this is like my, co- this is one of my like party tricks. Uh, Indian Ocean Territories. No. Yeah, sure. it does. 
It does. And dot M E. Oh God, now I'm gonna forget this one. That Middle East. No, no, that's a good, that's a great guess. No, it's um Montenegro. Serious. I've got a dot M E. Mr. Matt Davies dot M E. There Maybe. we are. So well, it's never done me any harm. Just putting it out there. <laughs> well, people when people use something like dot IO, so I'll give you here's like what can happen. I was at TechCrunch and I saw on a sign card dot io and i didn't know if the company name was card and that was just their domain name dot io if the it if it was pronounced card card dot io or cardio because you know how mm -hmm. sometimes with like the the right so that's that would be super clever wouldn't trouble. it was cardio <laughs> cardio i think would be fun but but then yeah, people get super mixed up on the dots, but yeah, I, I'm seeing more and more people using because just because the domain names are taken, but .com will always be king. Yeah, yeah, I've I've tried to pitch other top level domains, and people they say in our area people don't recognize that, so we can't use it. So it's, oh, it okay. often comes down to like who their audience is and how recognized it is. I think that's changing though. I I I think I think. You know, as time goes on, as you say, Alexandra, like we're all going to have to get more comfortable with, you know, diverse ways of kind of locating stuff. It's just going to, it's just going to, uh, it's going to evolve, I think. But yeah, amazing. What, what a nightmare it is, you know, with the complexities that are out there to, 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 to keep coming up with unique stuff. I just, you know, there's just a, such a volume that's continually growing. I'd love to know, um, and, uh, you know, how, how many domain names are being registered, like, and how, how, fast that's growing into i think you know there's probably some stats out there for that but i bet it's you know millions a year you know it's just just constantly growing so we've got to we've got to think outside the box in relation to that stuff yeah and what's so crazy so i i did a podcast last week with a, a guy that used to be a domain reseller and he told me there's 350 million in existence right now and yeah, yeah they're just getting harder and harder to find but it's funny here in the States, we, our toll free numbers used to all be 800 numbers. And then mm. they became 877 and 888 and 866. And you know what? Nobody cared. I think in the no. beginning, it might've been a little like, uh, I don't know, um, but nobody cared. Just like with our phone numbers now, no one cares where your area code is. People have moved on from that, but it's something about that dot com. Like people are just holding on to it. I mean, it's actually... It's it's both a, it's kind of a double edged sword for me. It's good because a lot of people think the domain name is really important, so they'll hire us to help them find one. But then it's also if people are like, no, we have to have an exact match. I'm like, yeah, we're not going to do that for you, and no naming firm will. There, there's very few that will guarantee that. It's too hard. Yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. So we're going to wrap this up. Is there anything else you'd love to? to share before yeah, we do? I did want to um, say one more thing about name changes. So if you are thinking about changing your name and you're like, people won't be able to find me, that might've been true 30 years ago, but it's never been easier for people to find you. You do a website redirect, you have an email of your, you have your customers' emails, you send them a big email blast, right? So you've got the newsletters, the social media. There's so many different ways for people to find you now. Um, your Instagram, right? All of that. So uh, I know someone who recently, I this guy's a paintless, paintless dent repair for cars. And I just, I came up with the best name. This is one that could just pop into my head. Ding, ding, ding. That's the name. Ding, ding, ding. Dent repair. Um, and he just changed his Instagram. Like he just changed it and it redirected. So there you go. Wow. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Where can people connect with you? Uh, eatmywords.com or follow me on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn and tell me that, tell, tell me that you saw me here on the podcast or heard me here. And don't forget to give this podcast an awesome rating. If you haven't already five-star rating for just branding. Very good books. Thanks, Alexandra. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on. I would also just sort of, sort of add at the end, don't forget Alexander's book. Uh, hello, my name is Awesome. I think, at least I know in the UK, you can get that through Amazon and probably yeah. other major uh, retailers. Yeah, so. this is the book. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Take care.